Hello, everybody. <laughs> One second. Okay. All right. Max Weber, Germans, there's a W, you pronounce it as a V, Max Weber. So here is, this is going to be what people consider the last of the big, th the big three, uh, Marx, Weber, and Durkheim. So my class is a little strange. If you take an intro to sociology, you're going to get a textbook with a bunch of general ideas, but all of these ideas come from these classic theorists. They're just maybe called a different name. The principle is from these theorists, the discipline, um, the core ideas. So, and every theorist after. So we went over Mills, uh, we went over Berger. They all are influenced by the theorists before. So I brought up uh, Mills and Berger to give you a kind of like semi-modern, which isn't even really technically modern, but uh, maybe Bergerus, Bergerus, uh they use other theorists. So when we studied Berger, we, you guys were learning about the dialectic, right? That was more uh, heavily used by Marx, which he used it from Hegel. And Mills uh, helped publish or translate a lot of, I believe both of Max Weber's work and also was influenced by Marx. So, my main point was showing you hierarchies, the peck, uh, pecking order, to show you sociology exists, the social exists. And then a couple of more modern theorists are easy to understand. Sociological imagination, social conception of reality. Again, evidence that the social world exists. And we've gone uh, through Durkheim, Marx, and now Weber. These are the big three. If you take a classical sociology class or a modern you're going to encounter these guys. So after Weber, we're going to get into uh, W.E.B. Du Bois and uh, a couple other uh, theorists, Martineau and Gilman. And we're gonna talk about race and sex. So this is like the last of the classic three, the big three. Okay. So last grand theorist, this is what I mean by big three. Marx, Weber, Durkheim, a lot of ideas about how the world worked. Published a lot of material. Um, people say we don't really see theorists like this anymore. Um, he had no overarching grand theory, but core concepts definitely, 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 definitely influenced more modern theorists. So rationalization, disenchantment of the world, Iron Cage, Protestant work ethic, so I'm going to explain to you in a simple way some of these ideas, but they're a lot, you know, uh, some of them are interweaving ideas. So anyway, we'll go into some in more detail. For example, rationalization. So I'm going to give you guys a kind of a equation. It's rationalization plus disenchantment of the world equals iron cage. Again, rationalization plus disenchantment of the world equals iron cage. So you kind of see this on the third third line. What does this mean? So these are these process, processes going on in what Max Weber sees as the modern world. Rationalization. Social institutions. Let's see, let me move my little picture. Interactions increasingly become governed by systematic methodical procedures. So we have this sort of like process towards what he calls uh, bureaucratization, further and further increased um, organization on, in every institutional level. Universities, 
um, other government in institutions. You could think of something like the DMV, the IRS. Um, and simultaneously, as this organizational structure occurs, and, and it does, the bureaucracy, whether you hate it or not, everybody thinks of a bureaucracy and they think of the DMV, right? So they think, oh, people that work there are depressed, you know, it's inefficient. That's not always so. Major political groups, think tanks, and political action committees are bureaucracy. It's supposed to be, according to Weber, sort of a hierarchy, but based on merit. Supposed to be, but still powerful. He says the bureaucracy is the single most powerful way that people organize. So don't think of just like the boring DMV. Think of more like political uh, action, re religious organization. Uh, still, a lot of religious organizations still work like work on a meritocracy. For example, look at the Catholic Church. You can't be a priest. You can't go up in the hierarchy without having education. The uh, seminary school for Catholic priests is the most rigorous out of all Christian denominations. You have schools that are regionally accredited. It takes a long time. Versus Protestant schools, those are like fly by night. Some are regionally accredited, but you can get like a the least rigorous form of accreditation is international. Like you could you could go to some internet school and like be ordained by some Protestant denominations. You cannot do that in Catholicism. One of my professors who passed, he spoke fluent Japanese, uh, fluent Italian. He could read uh, Greek. He was very very intelligent. This type of education is totally different. This structure, this bureaucracy is totally, totally different. Anyway, rationalization. Just think organizational process. Uh, disenchantment of the world. And I'm speaking in very general ways. Okay, there's way more complex ideas involved in each of these. Disenchantment of the world. Just think magic decreases. Our idea of uh, the world being sacred decreases. So the world loses its meaning, right? It Rationalization and disenchantment. Rationalizations like organization, also uh, the application of science and technology and looking at it as almost as if it's its own religion goes up, disenchantment of the world, down. So these processes are happening at the same time, okay? And both of those equals iron cage and a more... Faithful translation is steel shell, not iron cage, steel shell. And this is just another way of saying people are trapped by these forces, okay? Uh, people accuse Max Weber of, as being overly rational. He tries to be the, the sort of like classic, scientific, cold, distant observer. That's what people ta la label him as. So I'm not a Weber expert. I know more about Durkheim and Marx, but uh, this whole, this is like the core of a lot of his ideas, this equation. I increase rationalization, rationalization up, or I say science up, magic down equals iron cage. Science up, magic down equals iron cage. So I'll go over this more in class. Or if you're on my internet class, just remember that I'll, emphasize that in like comments I post. So another very, very famous idea, uh, Protestant work ethic and the spirit of capitalism. This is huge guys. Uh, so it seems complex, but we're gonna break it down. Spirit of capitalism, the pursuit of capital and profit as an end in itself. This is interestingly, very close to commodity fetishism and sort of money, worshiping money, like what Marx says. So the spirit is the cause of an uncertain form of Western capitalism. Protestantism influences this spirit by two ways. Okay, so basically, have you guys ever seen televangelists on TV? There's this, uh, you know, you, you, I'm not... <laughs> <laughs> you guys might think I'm always poo-pooing Christianity, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and remember, I always say, and I say this more than in class, uh, if you're American, you are culturally Christian. If you're American, 
we are culturally Christian. Not, and this is just isn't limited to the United States. Uh, this is a lot of European countries. But what does that mean? That means that unless you learn about Christianity and study the Bible, study Christianity, and probably go through some therapy, you are indoctrinated. Now, you might not think you are. And this is, this conversation has pissed both Christians and non Christians off. And I've had it with countless people, and I don't care. But you are. This is just, <laughs> I'll give you, I'll give you a simplified, convincing argument. Okay. If you know one religion, you know none. If you know one religion, you know none. Okay, that just means if you're indoctrinated in Christianity, your whole mind is programmed and you see every other religion as Christian or similar to Christianity. Until you study those, you won't have any idea of what you're indoctrinated by because the indoctrination is so complete. I'll give it to you another way. Another Great thinker in the field of religious studies, Max Mueller, says, if you know one language, you know none. Our ability to learn, if you if you only learn one language, that influences the way you think and how you label reality. So people don't like that thought, <laughs> both Christians and non-Christians alike. Anyway, okay. So Protestantism, what does that mean? We have Christianity, a wide spectrum of religion, right? There's over like a thousand denominations of Christianity. One of the most popular, Catholicism, and Eastern Orthodox Christianity, sort of like Russian Christian. It's like the, the crucifix with the little like extra line at the bottom that's like diagonal sloping. There's not just one. And people, people get that confused. Like, oh, I'm not Christian, I'm Catholic. Catholicism is Christianity. Don't get that confused. <laughs> Protestantism just means just think you're protesting against Catholicism. Okay. And then Protest Protestantism is a whole wide open door. Uh, Luther's, uh, Martin Luther, like 90, oh man, I don't even remember the particular number, 95 theses, I think. Uh, tacked on the door of the Catholic Church, which created Protestantism. Anyway, so we have these forces, and we have the American, particularly American way of Christianity and economy. So again, the it kind of got sidetracked, but the example of the televangelist on TV saying, "Give me your money." And, and you'll be blessed tenfold. Send me some money. And, and it's called like uh, the seed doctrine, I believe. Send me $5 and it'll come to you, you know, three times, four times, five times. This goes from, according to Weber, number one, a calling. So what does that mean? This is from Puritanism. This, the founders of our country that came on the Mayflower, that came on these original ships, asceticism through work, the specific job we are designed to do, that this fulfills our obligation to God. Basically, Puritanism, you are holy through work. That's how you get rid of sin, is by every day doing work. Okay, This is sort of like what monks and nuns do at monasteries. But in our modern times, uh, we think of this as like, this is more uh, Puritanism and Calvinism. So who's Calvin? Particularly in Calvinism, you have this idea of the doctrine of the elect. What does that mean? Doctrine of the elect. So some of you guys know about or have heard about the rapture. Paul talks a lot about the rapture. What is that? When it's the end of days, when it is uh, revelation, not revelations, revelation, which almost didn't even make it in the Bible, barely made it. 
We have Revelation, End of Times, Armageddon. Uh, we have a situation where only certain people, according to Paul in the rapture, ascend to heaven. The, the, the chosen, it's like a certain number. I don't even remember. Like 100,000 or I don't even know. It's a certain number. But Calvin says, how do we know who those people are? It's not the people who think they are chosen. These are random people because God has grace and he can forgive. So you may think you are, but you have no idea. So we have these two ideas. This is sort of like predestination. What I say, uh, what I wrote in the slide, doctrine of the elect. God's already chosen these souls. Think about how terrifying that is to some of you who especially are Christian. You can go to church every day. You can accept Jesus into your heart. You can volunteer to help homeless people or whoever, and you still might not go to heaven. This is what Calvin's saying. This is what Paul says too during the rapture. It's up to God. Someone who is evil, quote unquote, who receives God, God's grace might be a chosen, chosen one to be born again during the rapture and ascend to heaven and you might not people might think that's not fair i uh, do everything i'm supposed to not according to calvin so we have these two ideas from puritanism and from calvinism asceticism through work and predestination so these two ideas are very important so for puritans calling and vocation were interchangeable these words were used to describe the relationship with God in three main ways. God calls men into right action. God calls men to salvation. God calls men to vocation. So this is sort of uh, the idea of the calling is in both Puritanism and Calvinism. But for Puritans, it's being called to, to do the work. And this is uh, mundane work, right? It's being happy. It's, I don't know if any of you have ever been to a monastery. You don't have to go to a Christian monastery, but you can go to a Buddhist monastery. I've been to a Hindu monastery called Ashram. You do chores for a lot of the day. You do chores. Why? What do you think it takes to survive? You know, what do you do? All of you guys are in a relationship. If you don't, if I don't empty the dishwasher and uh, clean the calendar box, it's not happy in my house. My girlfriend gets pissed. <laughs> so part of it's for survival. The other part is to realize that's another way of kind of getting into the zone and realizing that, you know, uh, sort of like God's presence through work. So calling and vocation were interchangeable. Just think asceticism through work. Comes from Latin word vocatio. Also, Greek and Roman nobles believe that intellectual work intellectual work was the most sacred, not physical. Uh, vocation referred to the lifestyle amongst the nuns. And I'm telling you, if you guys haven't yet, and again, my background is I have a master's in religious studies and a master's in sociology. So you should stay at a monastery, see what it's like, or a nunnery if you're female. It's very interesting. You look at chores in a different way not especially if you stay like for weeks there's something that happens you look at everyday normal reality in a completely different way anyway uh under the protestant reformation luther encouraged people to leave the monastic lifestyle behind and blah blah, blah. corinthians god calls on us to express our faith in him do acts of loving service still more about like the puritan point of view Okay, now Calvin. Calvin believed that God had a certain calling for everyone in which they received special gifts. The Puritan movement grew out of the Reformation. The Puritan concept of the calling referred to a general calling and a particular calling. So being Christian and a specific job. Puritans rejected Roman Catholic, uh, Catholic monasticism the Puritan idea of vocation conceives of God in every aspect of ordinary life. Kind of talking about that already. Love and spirituality extends everywhere. So it's the idea of not isolating yourself, but going into, you know, the mundane everyday reality, what you're doing in your apartment, in your house, you know, everyday life. 
So here's his idea of the Protestant work ethic. Uh, Protestants, post Luther and Calvin, focus on worldly asceticism as the best and most ethical way to live your life. The Protestant ethic creates a harmful paradox, increasing the temptation to be selfish and evil. The very thing it's supposed to ward away to begin with. So what am I saying? Again, the televangelist example. There are people who put on infomercials or who are on TV at like two in the morning or in the middle of the afternoon, pretty much people talking to people who don't work and taking advantage of them, saying, send me your money, you'll be blessed tenfold. They may, and, and this goes, the idea of like, I think I'm pretty sure it's called the seed doctrine or the seed practice. Um, they send you kind of like talismans. So they'll send you like a picture of the priests or the whatever they call themselves. Not, not a priest, but um, anyway, some kind of authority figure uh, with their handprint, right? Or their footprint, or maybe like a piece of their hair. Strange things to take your money. So what happens? We have Protestant, uh, sorry, Puritan asceticism plus Calvinism, the doctrine of the elect merging together. Okay. And, and as a modern person with those two desires, there's a problem. What is it? If I work really, really hard, how do I know that I'm the chosen one of the chosen? There's this anxiety. There's an, uh, indis, you know, uh, uh, a fear of not knowing because you could do everything that's right. But how do I know? So the solution is the Protestant work ethic. You act as if you work hard. Uh, this is my cat, Jack Black. You work hard. And if you get money, you're, you're shown God's favor. So uh, that's evidence that God's me showing you his grace. So this starts to go get more and more amplified, more and more intense. You have uh, people working and working and getting more money and getting more money. And then it turns into this sort of worship of money itself. So we see here again, the Protestant work ethic creates a harmful paradox, increasing the temptation to be selfish and evil. The very thing, my cat's like really all over me. Say hello. The very thing it's supposed to ward away with. What a way to begin with. The process of, number one, the process of increasing profit, saving it and reinvesting creates greed, selfishness, and waste. Okay. Making money, my cat's attacking my Davy Crockett hat. Uh, this creates greed, selfishness, and waste. Oh, I'm just going crazy. All right. All right. Ah, I'm going to have to give her my hat. Yep. She's going nuts right now. All right. <clears throat> making money for the sake of making money. And then two, eventually the spirit of capitalism severs its connection to religion, and we have modern capitalism. So we look at this process. Again, Puritan plus Calvinism, money for the sake of making money, then the whole religion's dropped. Then it's a religion of money. This is what Weber's saying in a very simplistic way. My cat is going nuts on my hat right now. Now, my plan was to have different hats in every video, and my cat is ruining it. Okay. Protestant work ethic formula. So, ow, my cat's attacking my leg. Super mundane world, God is gone. Doctrine of the elect, problem. This is Calvinism. Chosen are saved. So we have asceticism, puritanism, plus proof of the elect, plus grace. We work towards being successful. If we're wealthy, we have God's favor. Then, we have these forces of rationality driven to success. God becomes eliminated. Religion becomes banished from the equation. You're working for profit, but working so hard that you're almost like a monk. Making profit for profit's sake, 
This is the spirit of capitalism. Okay, so just think of the main formula, Puritanism plus Calvinism equals Protestant work ethic. And then individually, Puritanism, uh, you realize the presence of God or every your salvation is through work. In Calvinism, same, work as if you're saved. But in Calvinism, we have that doctrine of elect. We have no, we don't have any idea if we're saved. So pretending we are lessens our anxiety. Then uh, as we're successful, God slowly leaves the equation. And then it's money for money's sake. So going into, this is another big idea from Weber, okay? These three types of authority, traditional, charismatic, and legal rational authority. All right, traditional authority. So we have societies based on customs, rules, power associated with family, personal loyalty. Um, obedience is tied to the holder of traditional authority. Basically, it is it is what it is because that's what we've always done. Or this is the way we've always done it. That's why it's good. That's why everybody follows those rules. So tradition is just heredity, uh, like hereditary passing of power. Okay. In these societies, the whole focus, the whole reason order exists is because it's just the history of the tradition. Okay. You find these in like really countries with really, really old cultures. And I keep saying China over and over and over again, but China. <laughs> okay. Maybe like historically the religious aspects like Buddhism and Taoism are less, but Confucianism is still there. So is Buddhism and Taoism, but much more controlled. Confucianism is sort of looked at, I would argue, as like a philosophy. In religious studies, we look at Confucianism, or I, I would argue that it's a religion. But anyways, traditional. This is the way we've always done it. That's why we do it. Why is that good? Why is that bad? Good? When something's a tradi traditional culture, that's a great way to preserve knowledge, right? If we didn't have tra traditional dances, foods, songs... Uh, clothes they'll be lost so tradition can preserve things what's bad you can have these like hierarchical structures like again my example in china the grandfather controls everything if you don't do what grandpa does you get smacked around you get ostracized from the family uh you just get in trouble you can get your resources cut off right that's what's bad um Blah, blah, blah. Okay, charismatic authority. So what is this? Think of musicians, actors, actresses. Charisma is made by a person's followers. Think of, excuse me, Instagram influencers, right? Based on personal qualities of the leader, power comes from personal devotion. Uh, what's good, what's bad? What's good is Anybody can have charisma. It doesn't depend on uh, traditional authority. It doesn't depend on really money. It's a personality characteristic. So it arguably it could be taught aspects of or how to be more charismatic. But it's this power that anyone can have. What's the downside? Uh, that person could literally be like a psychopath and have charisma. Just because you have a lot of followers doesn't mean that what you're saying is right. So that's what could be dangerous you could have like a cult leader right on the flip side maybe you could have like a religious hero like gandhi on the bad side maybe like david koresh and the branch davidians your church is getting burnt to flames right okay this is particularly interesting the cycle of charismatic authority i don't know how much time we'll be able to get into this but it's really interesting because it's how a lot of religious leaders and how they're um power how they rise plays out this is like very common cycle in religions so rebellious leader emerges 
and breaks traditional rules. Uh, the leader amasses followers, disciples. The leader is killed tragically. The leader passes on charisma to his followers through rituals rites. The followers pass on lessons from the leader and will eventually fracture. An institution is created and over time, the institution becomes the antithesis of the original leader's message. This is true in many of the most popular religions of the world, Christianity, rebellious leader emerges. Jesus like rebels against other uh, rabbis uh, or the Sanhedrin, like the official sort of like Jewish high court. Um, the power structure of Rome, right? He's the rebel. Then he gets disciples. He's killed tragically. He passes on his power to the disciples and acts. They get to speak in tongues and they get like powers from Jesus. Or uh, we can see also in the Old Testament, these powers of prophets that are godlike, you know, the power to raise, uh, raise the dead, heal the sick, ascend to heaven. Followers pass on lessons from the leader. The, and then an institution happens. You know, the disciple Peter He's like the rock of the church. The church is created. And now you have churches that exist now that have nothing to do with anything that Jesus says. In fact, probably if Jesus existed, the, you probably pass by him as a homeless person on the side of the road. You probably told him to get a job. And, and <laughs> the, the, a lot of uh, churches today would talk trash about that. Don't be lazy. Make money. Be successful. You see, not every, not every church. But you see some people behave uh, in a way that's not like what Jesus said at all. Not what Paul said, but what Jesus said. Okay, two different things. Also in Buddhism, you have Siddhartha. He's supposed to be a uh, king, Indian king. His father's told that by like this astrologer, great king or a world redeemer. What happens? He sees old age, sickness, death. He sees reality. He he uh, leaves his royalty, his his all the money and heritage, uh, power from his family behind. That's being a rebel. He's walking away. He leaves uh, his wife and I think a child. That's rebellious. He goes on his quest, sits under the you know, does all these things, studies with ascetics, studies with different people. Um, meditates under the Bodhi tree is tempted and then finds the middle way. So he gets followers and disciples. Then he dies. And then he, his disciples kind of have power. Then there's sort of a religious institution. And some people might argue that certain Buddhist institutions or monasteries or, you know, organizations don't uh, represent the message of the founder. So this is just this cycle of charismatic authority that's, you know, happens in a lot of religions, or it's just the cycle in charismatic people, like influencers or musicians or actors. Legal rational authority. Max Weber, this is what we're talking about, bureaucracy. So this is based on intentionally created rules. Authority only applies to members. Everyone's subject to the rules. And people, it's supposed to be a meritocracy. You have to get training, certificate, a degree to advance. So we'll think of legal rational, rational authority as a university, right? You can't have positions of power without degrees. Even an admin, you have to have education. So we see uh, whether or not you like it, you know, especially in, in America, we have some of the best universities in the world are K through 12 public education is horrible. I would argue some of the worst in the world, but our universities, everyone, even countries that are our rivals sends, uh, they send their kids here if they're wealthy to study at American universities. And while there may be a lot of problems, there was a huge, like, uh, the whole UC system, uh, what is it like um, TAs and uh, teachers assistants, research assistants, basically students that are in grad level, post bachelor's level, get paid crap, nothing 
to do work that the university bills people in tuition to pay for. So a lot of classes uh, that you'll see at UCs, when you get up to the higher levels, are taught by TAs uh, or PhD students. So you're paying tuition. Think of like a 300 a classroom with 300 students how much it costs to take that class and how much they're paying the student that's teaching it pennies crumbs. So you have, you know, there's a reason for that. There's a reason, you know, it builds character. You go through initiation, you have to work hard, but at the same time, when the university becomes uh, worried more about profit and they get subsidies from the government, it's sort of, it, the administration is bloated. It's inefficient. There's a lot of, it's a complex issue. I'm just saying it in a simple way, very general way that bureaucracies and legal rational authority is powerful. Probably according to Weber, and he's probably right. The most effective way to organize humans to accomplish a goal, to have power. But if there isn't any checks and balances, um, I'm trying to remember this story it's like how bureaucracies can maintain that kind of meritocracy, like criticism and uh, constant education, similar, similar to uh, Dunning-Kruger effect. So Dunning-Kruger effect is like in psychology. It's this phenomena that happens where people think they're more knowledgeable than they are. And this happens to everyone. Obviously, if you're not educated, you think you know more about something than you actually do, but this affects educated people. We have areas that we specialize in, and then we have holes, right? Um, areas where we're not competent or we need to increase our competency. And so we might think we know more than we do because we don't want to acknowledge our weakness. And how do we get rid of that? Or how do we lessen that? Constant education and criticism. So this is what also... I'm trying to remember the article I read. It's called The Iron Laws of Bureaucracy. And then I don't even remember the name of the author, but I was going on a Max Weber, you know, kind of search or binge one day. And uh, people defending the bureaucracy as an effective way to organize. So this is legal, rational authority. So we have uh, traditional. We do it because that's the way it's always been done. Charismatic. Follow me because you love me and then legal rational. Um, I have a position of power because of my credentials, right? If you work hard and study, you rise in the ranks through merit. Anyone can have charisma. Uh, people that have uh, power in traditional societies, usually probably patriarchal, usually probably a male, and because your family has power tra traditionally. So there's strengths and weaknesses of every kind of power structure. So I think that's enough for now. We have Protestant work ethic. We have, oh, we didn't really talk about, uh, uh, that's what I talked about. We won't get into that last. So I want you to remember the iron cage, rationalization, which means science, just think science up, disenchantment of the world, Magic down equals iron cage. Uh, then we have the Protestant work ethic. Puritanism plus Calvinism equals Protestant work ethic. It's more complicated than that, but it's a simple way to think about it. And then three types of authority. Traditional, charismatic, and uh, legal rational. So these are the main ideas I'll type it in and remind you guys but in a general way this is what he's talking about these are important these will kind of echo on in sociology in different ways so hope you enjoyed my new hat that i wore my cat was attacking me um i'll probably try to wear another hat in my next video because my first few i just wear a tie and i was probably gonna wear a tie but now i'm into wearing different hats so to those of you that are still paying attention to this, which is probably few, um, uh, hope you learned something. I'll, you know, add some main points and have a good day or night.